St Andrews, South Brisbane. Last Sunday, Steve Wachner was with us at the 8.30 service. He comes once a year when he's down at Diocesan Synod. He's the rector of Kawana. Later that afternoon, he asked me how I felt preaching before the governor. I told him I took it in my stride, although I was aware of concentrating on looking uh, somewhere out there rather than looking at the front pew. But I had it. I was quite glad that I didn't have the previous week's passage talking about sexual immorality. All this is by way of preface to me saying that I feel a little awkward addressing how today's final passage from 1 Thessalonians begins. Please turn to it, page 1188 and 89 of the Church Bibles, chapter 5 beginning at verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work, live in peace with each other. Those Paul is saying should be acknowledged and held in the highest regard are church leaders, pastors. The first point to be made is that the church, young as it was in Thessalonica, already had leaders, what we may refer to as the pastorate. But there may be some let-out clauses that uh, spare my blushes. The word the NIV translates as acknowledge has as its basic meaning no, and could be translated as recognize. Perhaps Paul is implying that not all pastors work hard and the brothers and sisters should be discerning about this. It's those who do work hard and care for you in the Lord who should be held in the highest regard in love. Paul continues in verse 14, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. This is usually thought to refer to a group within the congregation. The NIV study Bible comments, it seems some Thessalonians were so sure that the second coming of Jesus was close that they had given up their jobs in order to prepare for it. But is it not possible that those who are idle and disruptive include some of the pastors. Read this way, Paul is saying, discern who are those who work hard among you and care for you as opposed to those who are idle and disruptive. The first group are to be held in the highest regard in love because of their work, i.e. because of what they do, whereas the second group are to be warned because of what they don't do, they're idle, or because they're disruptive. I remember my first training incumbent being dismissive of those who claim to have a ministry of presence. His retort was that they'd be of more use if they actually did something. But this still leaves questions. What does hard work look like? Is, for example, a lot of apparent activity with very little to show for it a desirable state of affairs? What does genuine care for you in the Lord look like? 
I don't think it means affirming everything and everyone unquestioningly, seemingly. Caring involves admonishment. Ouch. As Paul continues in verses 14 and 15, he gives more details of what care in the Lord involves. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And then there's the underpinning that enables all this activity to take place. Verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Corrie Ten Boom and her sister Betsy were in Ravensbrook concentration camp. They've read this passage and are praying. Thank you, Betsy went on serenely, for the fleas and for the fleas. This was too much. Betsy, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. That's Corrie speaking. Give thanks in all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. And so we stood between piers of bucks and gave thanks for fleas. But this time I was sure Betsy was wrong. Later in her book, The Hiding Place, Corrie writes... One evening, I got back to the barracks. Betsy was waiting for me. Her eyes were twinkling. You're looking extraordinarily pleased with yourself, I told her. You know, we've never understood why we had so much freedom in the big room, she said. Well, I found out. The point being that the freedom had enabled them to hold Bible studies. That afternoon, she said, there'd been confusion in her work group and they'd asked the supervisor to come and settle it. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door and neither would the guards. And you know why? Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice because of the fleas. That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas from the general thanksgiving. We bless you for our creation and preservation and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. The theologian Karl Barth spoke of the word having three aspects. The word incarnate, Jesus The word written, that's how the 39 articles refers to the Bible, and the word preached. When the word is preached, something happens. Something new is created, reaching back through the Bible to see Jesus. That, I would suggest, is our contemporary version of prophecy. We now have the complete canon of Scripture, all 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 
and 27 in the New Testament. There's nothing that can be added. This is the complete Word of God. All we need to know in order to know Jesus. But preaching, prophecy, can help us to apply the Word to our lives. It brings the past into the present for us. Preaching is enabled by the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. And it is to be tested against the standard of Scripture. I know that Peter and Lorna have a particular concern for Bible reading in church, as possibly do others, and as do I. Paul says in verses 25 to 27, Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. All the verbs from verse 16 onwards are in the plural. Prayer, thanksgiving, preaching, Bible reading are all in the context of people gathering together as a church. It would be impossible to greet all God's people with a holy kiss if they weren't in each other's presence. The Old Testament would have been read as part of worship in the early church. That would have been inherited from the synagogue tradition. To that, Paul adds the reading of the New Testament letters. Note that whereas prophecy is to be tested, Paul does not say that of Scripture. Scripture is to be embraced for what it is, the infallible Word of God. Paul started our passage with talk of admonishment, living in peace with each other, and warning the disruptive while being patient with everyone. I'm tempted to say that's a hard act to pull off, even in a church like St Andrew's. It certainly requires prayer and the Holy Spirit. It also requires input from and measurement against the Bible, what the Bible has to say. It may require being willing to be unpopular for the sake of the truth. Seventeen times in First Thessalonians and five times in today's passage, Paul says, brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a family affair. When we gather for worship, God is our Father. We are brothers and sisters. We love each other as brothers and sisters in the family. We want to support one another with pastors as a kind of elder brother in the Lord. Let's endeavour to live out this beautiful vision of the church family. Amen.